So we find ourselves in this series called Told You So. And it's about prophecy being fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about a lot of prophecy today, all right? So I encourage you to stay with me. Uh, download the Bible or the Journey Church app if you haven't because you're going to need it. There's a lot of scripture. So I don't think we've really discussed what prophecy is. So what is prophecy? Well, it's one of the spiritual gifts that we find in 1 Corinthians 12. The primary purpose of this gift is edification, right? Edification, exhortation, and comfort of the church. And it's emphasized what Paul, by what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. He states this, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation. You see, prophecy involves receiving and then conveying a message that was heard from God, often addressing current needs, challenges, and then encouragement needed by individuals or a community, say the church. But this gift of prophecy does not grant infallibility or override anything scripture says, right? It does not override the authority of scripture. Instead, it operates within the framework of God's word. What I've heard someone say to me, which I love so much, is that the spirit and the word has to agree. It has to. The spirit and the word has to agree. So prophecy, when exercised responsibly, in accordance with biblical principles, it serves to strengthen the faith of believers. It can foster this deeper, deeper understanding of God's will, and it can contribute to the spiritual growth and unity of the church. And that's what I pray for today. I pray that this thing will strengthen your, your spiritual growth and the unity. It will give you a greater understanding of God's will today. And then it's going to strengthen your faith as we dig through all these prophecies that we see fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise because you're truly worthy of it all. Father, I thank you for all that you're doing here at Journey. I thank you for everything that's going on, the lives that are being changed and transformed, Father. I pray today that you give us eyes to see what it is that you have for us ears to hear what it is, and I pray that you soften the hearts of those that just may be in here doubting, are you for real? Is this Bible for real? Father, I pray that you soften their hearts and they hear exactly what you want them to hear. As I always pray, remove me from this stage, Father. Don't let any words from me be heard, but only what you want heard, Father. Let me give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. So now we know what it is, we know what it's for, how likely is it for the prophecy to be fulfilled? I mean, there's already hundreds of them that's already been fulfilled, but really, what's the likelihood of this being fulfilled, this one man coming to fulfill these prophecies that I'm going to talk about? I mean, truly, what are the odds? Which is exactly what I entitled this message. What are the odds of this happening? So we're going to take eight scriptures, eight prophecies. You're going to see a lot more than that today in the stuff that I read. But I'm going to talk about eight specific ones that lead up to Jesus' death, right? That, that find us in this week that we find ourselves in history, right? Where it's leading up from Palm Sunday, leading all the way up to his death. And I encourage you, like I said before, to download the, the Journey app if you don't have it already. I'm telling you, there's like 1,500 words of scripture that we're going through today. I'm literally gonna let the Bible preach itself. The word of God is gonna preach it and that's what's gonna happen. So are you ready? All right, so it's Palm Sunday. It's where we find ourselves on the American calendar, right? Where Jesus rode in. And then next week is Resurrection Sunday when he died, was risen from the grave, amen? So let's look at a prophecy that is not going to be one of the eight that we talk about, but this is an important one. It sets the stage. It's outside of these eight that we're going to talk about in a little bit. This is a very unique one. It'll lead us right up to those eight prophecies. It'll lead us right up to the time. And this prophecy that we're going to talk about has multiple, multiple layers. 
It's got layers of prophecy that have been fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled, which is exactly what that screen says. Prophecy filled and yet to be. So Daniel 9, verses 2 and 3. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and pleading with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. First things first. It's interesting to see the prophet Daniel is reading from the prophet Jeremiah, right? That encourages you and reminds you that there's a benefit in reading scripture, that we all have to be reading scripture daily. Even a prophet was needing to read a prophet. We all need to be reading and studying scripture over and over. This is what he was reading in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25, 11 through 12. This entire land will be a place of ruins, an object of horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Babylon will be judged. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and the nations declares the Lord for their wrongdoing, the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. So Jeremiah says that Jerusalem was to last 70 years. This desolation was to last 70 years for them. And that must have triggered Daniel's thinking. Because right now Daniel is in like the 67th to 69th year of this reign that's going on. So it's triggering something in his mind of what he's read before. Notice Daniel says he's reading from the books. It's plural, right? Which means he's consulting other scriptures. I was literally having a conversation with somebody this morning about how they got excited about studying scripture and cross-referencing and going back and forth and looking at stuff and things that came to their mind as they're reading, that's exactly what you should be doing, exactly what Daniel's doing right here. He's remembering what he's reading, he's seeing what he's reading, he's cross-referencing, he's looking at different scriptures, he's taking it for what it is, right, and he's looking at all the other scriptures that tie together with it. That's how you should be studying scripture. Not just taking one verse and looking at just that one. And the more and more you read it, the more and more that it becomes a part of you, right? You start to see other things as you're reading scripture. Other things start to jump out at you when you're reading it. The word is alive. So you start taking this scripture and let it speak. Where does it need to take you to? Well, he's probably reading from Leviticus 26 as well when he's reading. Look at what this says in this chapter. The Lord promised to set Israel outside the land if they disobeyed their land Sabbath law that they had. Leviticus 26. Then the Lord will restore its Sabbath all the days of the desolation. While you are in your enemy's land, then the land will rest and restore its Sabbath. It's interesting. They were supposed to allow the land to rest every seventh year, but they didn't do that. It's just like we're supposed to rest every seventh day, right? I'm thankful it's not every seven years that he's instructed us to rest, but it's every seventh day, right, that we're instructed to rest. But they didn't do it. They didn't obey that law, and it went on for 490 years, 70 years of land Sabbaths that were owed, just as Jeremiah had talked about. So you're seeing a prophecy coming true right here. And that Leviticus 26 says he would put Israel out of the land for 70 years until that penalty, and they had to let that land rest, was done. So now Daniel's putting two and two together in his head. He's like, all right, I hear what you're saying. I see what it's saying. 70 years, we're almost there. We're almost to this time. It's all coming true. This prophecy is being fulfilled, right? He concluded that Israel's 70 years in Babylon was the appointed time for the penalty. And after the land had enjoyed that 70 years of rest, his people would be set free and allowed to return to Israel. And that's exactly what happened. He was absolutely correct in that assumption and putting all those pieces together, looking at scripture, that exactly happened just the way it was written. In a couple years, Darius would be replaced by Cyrus. Cyrus, Cyrus would issue this decree and his people would be let back in. But Daniel misinterpreted scripture and assumed too much about what he was reading right here, which should give you some hope and also 
a humbling moment that if Daniel can mess up interpreting scripture, so can we. So can we. But we need to be humble enough to receive the correction from God that he will give us for the right interpretation, the right insight with understanding. And that's what we see that's going to happen. See, he thought this was the end of the age. He thought at the end of this 70 years that the Messiah is going to be coming, the kingdom is going to be coming, and everything is going to be restored back to like it was in the garden. And then he started to pray. He started to do this confessional prayer at this point in Daniel 9. But why did he feel the need to pray like this? Why did he feel the need to uh, repent for the entire nation stuff? Leviticus 26. But if they confess their wrongdoing, the wrongdoing of their forefathers and their unfaithfulness which they committed against me and also when they're acting with hostility against me, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies or if their uncircumcised heart is humbled so that then they make amends for their wrongdoing, then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob. I'll remember also my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham as well, and I'll remember the land. So as Daniel reads these words, he correctly recognized the 70 years for the 70 land Sabbaths, right? Of Israel's captivity in Babylon was the penalty for that land Sabbath, for ignoring it. But he mistakenly assumed that that 70 years was for everything, was for the whole nation of Israel as a whole, for that whole 490 years. So Daniel begins to engage in this national confessional prayer. And you see that in a lot of the rest of Daniel that uh, I don't have in here, but it's a, it's a long confessional prayer, hoping, hoping to usher in this kingdom. He's hoping to usher this thing in by this prayer because what he's reading, but he's getting it wrong. He has the right idea. He's reading the right stuff, but he's got the wrong timing. And how often do we do that? We hear something, we think we hear something, but we have the most wrong time about what we're hearing because we're not getting all of what's been said see it was 70 years for the 70 land sabbaths those 70 years that were missed that's what it was for but it's going to take much much longer for the whole 490 year period that they didn't do it for does that make sense there's going to be a long long more time before that comes so daniel's mistake prompts the lord Aren't we so good that he corrects us? Aren't we so thankful that he corrects us in the midst of the wrong stuff that we do, that he'll correct us lovingly? So Daniel's mistake, the Lord corrects Daniel by sending the angel Gabriel, right, to give Daniel this correct view of what's going on. So in the process, we gain the answers to the question, what is the end of the age? What is the age of the Gentiles? What does this look like? And it begins in Daniel 9, 23. This is Gabriel talking now. At the beginning of your pleas, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you because you are highly, highly esteemed, so pay attention to the message, gain understanding of the vision, 70 weeks and the Messiah. So in the midst of Daniel praying, in the midst of it, Heavenly Father sees and is like, Gabriel, go take care of this. Go give this guy understanding because he's got the wrong understanding right now. So he dispatched Gabriel down there. And now here's the correct understanding. Gabriel's going to tell him, this is when the end of the age. This is what you're looking for. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the wrongdoing, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. That scripture will preach for two hours. We don't have that time. All right? But that's the reason for it. That's the reason why this 70 weeks is come. That right there is a picture looking for when Jesus comes back to reign forever and ever, and the new heaven and the new earth is here. Amen? That's what that's for. But 70 weeks? That's shorter than 70 years. So what's the meaning for this? Why does why this say 70 weeks and not 70 years? You got to understand what that word weeks in the Hebrew is. That means seven. 
So that's 77. That's 490 years. Do you see the tie to how long they did the land, how long they did the stuff? Everything is for a reason, right? So now Gabriel burst Daniel's bubble right now and is like, no, man, it's 490 years. Could you imagine Daniel at that point? Oh, right? He was, he was thinking this was coming. And he's like, no, it's 490 years. But even that doesn't make sense to us right now, right? Because it's been a lot longer than 490 years. So where's this process? What is this, right? So it turns out 490 years is counted in a very unique way. And Gabriel tells Daniel what that is. Daniel 9. So you are to know and understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with streets and moat and even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, having nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will confirm a covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice, grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come to the one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, gushes forth on the one who marks desolate, who makes desolate. So Daniel 7 is counted in three different blocks. So you get the first block, which is the seven sevens, the 49 years. So that first block is from when the decree is issued until the rebuilding of the city. Guess what? It happened. It happened 49 years, right? The decree was issued. The rebuilding happened. There's one of the part of the prophecy. Then you've got the second part, which is from when the city was rebuilt until Jesus Messiah, right? That is 62 weeks, 434 years. So in total, right, you've got from a decree being issued until Jesus Messiah being cut off. When Jesus Messiah being cut off, we now know that as Jesus dying on the cross, where we find ourselves, right, the prophecy I'm going to talk about, when Jesus dies on the cross. That's 69 weeks, that's 483 years. But what's interesting, right, is this event that we talk about now in verse 27 we see the final seven-year period beginning with a covenant. But that part is not attached to any part of those 69 weeks. It's set aside different. It's in a time further down the road, some unknown time, right? But why? Why is there this break in the pause in the timeline? Why did this break happen between the 69th and 70th week? Look at scripture, 2 Peter. Know this first off, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, falling after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. How often have you heard, oh, when's he coming? He's, he's supposed to be coming. He's not here. He says he's coming in the last days. He says he's coming quick, right? Well, what's that word quick? Second Peter 3, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be discovered. There's a pause because he's not willing and he's patient. He wants none to perish. So if you're sitting in here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the pause is for you. That pause is for each and every one of you. That's why there's a pause here. The pause is for us to go out and evangelize and to spread the word and take these cards that are on your seat. They were up here earlier. On your seat and hand them out to people. The pause is there because the 70th week is coming. That 70th week is coming quick. Very quick. You can see the signs of it. Amen? So we have to be living on mission. So why did I talk about Daniel. There's a timeline there that's set up perfectly, and it shows, and it was absolutely perfect 
the timeline that Gabriel gave Daniel, the 69 weeks from when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And that leads us to the other prophecies that are found leading up to Jesus' dying on the cross. The first one of the eight. Pastor Adam talked about this one last week. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recover of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He's reading in Isaiah 61, remember. There's so many things in there that are prophecy that have been fulfilled. I'm just taking one of them. Let's look at the sight of the blind. Let's look in the natural realm of him giving sight to a blind person. And he did it multiple times. But like I said, let's look at the ones leading up right to his death in the week that we find ourselves in. So in Luke 18, Jesus asked this question. What do you want me to do for you? Could you imagine asking that question to like your wife, your husband, to anybody that you know the question that was worded that way? What do you want me to do for you? Right? That's how I picture it in my head, right? What do you want me to do for you? It's worded in that way for a very specific reason because you have to look at rest of scripture and remind yourself of what else, right? So the disciples get an I told you so moment right in the middle of this. In Mark's account of the same event, Jesus, or just a few verses before this, just a few verses before Jesus asked Barnabas, what do you want me to do for you? He asked the same exact question to James and John. And they answered him, will you allow us to sit on your left and your right in glory? And Jesus is like, you have, you have no idea what you're asking. You have no idea. He tells them not to be served but to serve, to live their life as a ransom for others. You see, they asked the question and the answer they got was no. Was no. Because they didn't have the right heart posture. They didn't have the right motives. They didn't have the right stuff behind it. Then he asked Bartimaeus the same exact question, worded the same exact way, what do you want me to do for you? And all Bartimaeus wanted was to see. That's it. He just wanted to see. This is an I told you so moment right in the middle of this. For those that asked to sit on the left and the right. They had the wrong heart posture, the wrong question. They asked the same question but received a different answer because of it. But when they saw Bartimaeus get sight, they rejoiced. They rejoiced when Bartimaeus received sight. They did not uh, sit there and pout. They took the correction. They humbled themselves as Daniel did and took what was being taught and they rejoiced. They didn't allow Barnabas joy. Barnabas receiving his gift hindered their excitement for him. They didn't have bitterness towards him. How can we know this? Luke 18, 41. Keep reading. And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Jesus said to him, regain your sight. Your faith has made you will. And immediately he regained his sight, began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they praised God. So even the ones that asked to sit on the left and the right were praising God for Barnabas, giving him sight. May we be so humble to do the same thing. When we ask for something, right, that may not come, right, it may not even be because of a heart posture. It just may not be the right timing or whatever the case may be. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than ours, right? But may we rejoice for those that receive. Amen? All right, Zechariah 9.9. This is the second one. This was written 500 years before Jesus fulfilled it. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous, endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. You find this exact same thing written in all four gospels. You find it in Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. It's written in every single one of them. It talks about that triumphal day, that day that we talk about today, right? The day that we celebrate today as Palm Sunday, of Jesus riding in on a donkey with everyone saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're laying down their palm branches, right? They're calling him king, 
the only time he allowed them to call him king because prophecy was being fulfilled at this moment. Let's look at this third one. This third one was written like a thousand years before Jesus fulfilled this. Psalm 41. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. John 13, 18. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know the ones whom I have chosen. But this is happening. So that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. John 13, 26. Jesus then answered, that man is the one for whom I shall dip the piece of bread and give it to him. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Let's look at the fourth one. 500 years before this was written. Zechariah 11. And I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver, threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Look at Matthew. Then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they set out for him 30 pieces of silver. Look at Matthew 27 here. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse, returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? You shall see to yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and left. He went away, hanged himself. The chief priest took the pieces of silver and said, it is not lawful to put them in the temple treasury, since this money is paid for blood. And they conferred together, and with the money, bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which is spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one whose price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, just as the Lord directed me. Now some of you are probably thinking, that said Jeremiah, but we looked at Zechariah. And I, I bring this up because we're talking about prophecy and how some people will try and prove this stuff is an error or whatever. The Bible is not an error, amen? There's no errors in here, amen? So what's happening is, when you're reading this, it's, he's pulling, Matthew's pulling, as we all should, from multiple different books. He's reading Jeremiah, which is Jeremiah 19, talks about innocent blood. Jeremiah 32 talks about a potter's house, talks about the selling of it, right? The potter's field. He's reading in Zechariah, but all he does is he references the major prophet aspect when he's talking about it. You see the same thing in Mark. You see the same thing in Second Chronicles where they reference, they're referring to multiple different things but only reference the major prophet. And that's what's happening here. The Bible is never in error. Amen? Let's look at number five. Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the plunder with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was counted with wrongdoers. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded with the wrongdoers. Once again, multiple prophecies fulfilled in this thing. But we're going to talk about one of them. Let's talk about the wrongdoers. Luke 22. And he said to them, but now whoever has a money belt is to take it along. Likewise, also a bag. And whoever has no sword is to sell his cloak, buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted with wrongdoers. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment. They said, Lord, look, here are two swords. He said to them, it is enough. You got to remember, this is before when they're getting ready to go into the garden. He knows he's getting ready to be delivered over to the hands. There's an army coming after him. Two swords was not enough, right? I, I mean, in all honesty, all Jesus had to do was speak, right? But we're going to get to that point where he doesn't. Right? The two swords was not going to be enough. It's to be counted with wrongdoers is what the purpose of those two swords were. Let's stay in Isaiah 53 here. Right? Let's stay in Isaiah 53 for the 6th, 7th, and 8th prophecy we're going to talk about. You see, Isaiah 53, this was all prophesied 700 years before Jesus fulfilled it. But you've got to put it together with Daniel, 
who prophesied 500 years before that with the timing. So you've got a guy fulfilling all of this and the exact timing of what Daniel prophesied 500 years before and it was Isaiah's prophesying 700 years before that. I mean, what are the odds of this happening? Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our offenses. John 19. Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Immediately blood and water came out. Verse 37. And again, another scripture says, they will look at him whom they pierced. In this same scripture, I don't have it here for you, but in the same scripture, it talks about not even a bone being broken on Jesus, right? Which is important because the law states that the Passover lamb cannot have any broken bones. So in order for Jesus to be the Passover lamb, he could not have any broken bones. I mean, it's prophecy after prophecy that's being fulfilled, being fulfilled, being fulfilled in front of your eyes. So I pray if you're in here and you're doubting and you're questioning, look what's going on. Verse 7, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Matthew 27. They stripped him, put a red cloak on him, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, took the reed, and beat him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the cloak off him, put his own garments back on him, and led him away to crucify him. Talk about being oppressed. And he never even opened his mouth. But yet all he had to do was speak. And an army of angels is coming down and taking care of everything that's going on. But he was oppressed but did not speak. Isaiah 53, 9. And his grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was writ with a rich man in his death. It's talking about Jesus would die. Matthew 27. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out in the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. But let me tell you, he's not dead. He's alive. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. The grave could not hold him, amen? He has overcome the grave and come back next week to hear that message. Now that was just eight, right? Eight prophecies. But there's a lot more that you saw inside of there. There was way more prophecies that were in there that I talked about. What are the odds of that happening? I mean... I didn't even talk about the prophecy in Micah that was fulfilled in Matthew where it talks about he's going to shepherd his people. I didn't even talk about the one in Isaiah 7 that was fulfilled in Matthew 1 that states the virgin will conceive, give birth to a son, his name will be Emmanuel. But what are the odds that this one man would fulfill all these prophecies in the timing that Daniel 9 gives us that the Messiah is going to be coming? I mean, what's the odds of one man being born of a virgin, given sight to the blind, betrayed by a friend, valued at 30 shekels, was counted with wrongdoers, was oppressed, was pierced, was killed in the exact timing of the 483-year prophecy that was said in Daniel 9? There's only one example in our natural that I can give you, that I came across, that really hits hard with what are the odds and is this truly real? Is God really writing the Bible? Is Jesus truly who Jesus is? If you can imagine a silver dollar, and if you can imagine a silver dollars covering the entire state of Texas, two feet deep, this number is like 10 to the 17th. You can't even imagine it. And with the prophecies that I talked about, that number goes even way beyond that. So you've got silver dollars two feet deep covering Texas. And you put a dot on one of those. And you throw that thing out there. And then you stir it up like some spaghetti. And then you take somebody and you blindfold them. And you put them in a helicopter and you fly them over the state of Texas. And you wait for them to tell you, okay, let's set it down here. I don't know if you've flown in a helicopter, it doesn't just set straight down. And then they get out and they dig around and they give you that coin. 
that has the dot on it. That's the odds of one man fulfilling everything that I just talked about in the timing of Daniel. That's what we're talking about here. Jesus is real. The numbers don't lie. If you're in here doubting, questioning, wondering if the Bible is for real, it's for real. He is the way and the truth. There is no other way. There is no other explanation for all of this to happen. And the great thing is, you don't have to do anything if you're in here. And you don't have a relationship with him. You don't have to clean yourself up first. You don't have to get yourself right first. It's about faith. It's about surrender. He'll do the cleaning up for you. Trust me. He did it in my life. He can do it for you. You see, so Daniel 9's gap was for you. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. As we close, will you rise to your feet?